Hi, welcome to Culturally Determined. I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade. And my guest today is Professor Stephen Greenblatt. Uh, Professor Greenblatt, could you introduce yourself? I am, as you said, Professor Stephen Greenblatt. Uh, I teach at Harvard and I'm talking to you from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, thank you so much for coming on today. So you are the author of, most recently, this book, um, Tyrant, Shakespeare on Politics is the subhead. Uh, this is the library copy, but I encourage people to go out and actually purchase it themselves. Um, <laughs> and you are the author of a number of other books, um, perhaps most notably uh, Will in the World, and also um, The Swerve, which won the Pulitzer Prize. Is that correct? Yes, it's good. Yeah. Um, so thank you. So you are noted uh, Shakespeare scholar. Um, I'm a big Shakespeare fan, and so it's a treat to have you on today. Um, so this... Most recent book, can you kind of talk about what um, what spurred you to write this book? Well, Arya, I've thought about Shakespeare, as you've indicated, for a long time. Uh, so he's never very far from my mind. Uh, in this case, uh, I decided uh, to much more recently and to do it much more in a much more concentrated way than I usually do. These projects often evolve over six, seven, eight years, but in this case, uh, in the course of a year, uh, I decided to write a book about uh, Shakespeare on politics or on power, uh, and I did so, uh, how should we say, as a way to, partly as a way to use my uh, responses to, the, to uh, contemporary events to think back into the past, but also to use the past to think about contemporary events. That's always going on, but it was going on with an unusual intensity for me uh, in this book. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was describing this book to people, I my one word, my one line summary of it was, um, "It's about Shakespeare on Trump." Um, <laughs> but the, the the word Trump or the name Trump never appears in this in this book, as far as I can tell. Um, is calling it? Am I accurate to say this is this is a book about what Shakespeare would have thought about Trump, or is that a misreading? Well, it's it's not altogether a misreading, but uh, first of all, uh, in terms of our own moment, I mean, yes, of course, uh, Donald Trump was in my mind, uh, but but also um, Erdogan and uh, Duterte, uh, uh, Orban, uh, Putin, uh, and a whole range of uh, of people in the world now who represent a different. Uh, anti-liberal democracy, more authoritarian uh, account, the kind of people who would think that they had the absolute authority to pardon themselves, for example, mm -hmm. and, and uh, for any crime, or who could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and uh, they wouldn't lose any of, uh, of their position and so forth. But as I say, it's not just uh, Trump and I, and, and I hope... Uh, of course, this may be a kind of naive hope. I hope that uh, that my book uh, and indeed all of us will uh, long outlive uh, the current moment. Yes, I hope hope so as well. Um, so you you start the book with uh, an analysis of the three Henry the Sixth plays. Um, these are probably among the least well known among the general public of the plays. I didn't, I took, you know, four Shakespeare classes in college and we didn't read any of them. I, I read them after graduating. Um, they're early kind of apprentice works and yeah, they're just not, they're not staged very often. They're not really in the culture. Why, why did you decide to um, start there and devote a lot of time to those plays? I mean, first of all, they're in their slightly crazy way, brilliant plays. So uh, even as plays that well, may be, have been written by, um, by uh, Shakespeare with other people. And as you say, even though they are in some important ways apprentice work, they're wonderful and full of crazy things, uh, fascinating things, still alive. Uh, but also, uh, they are Shakespeare's first uh, sustained uh, way into questions that haunted him throughout his career, 
uh, how do societies fall into the hands of catastrophic leaders? How does it happen? Uh, why do people who ordinarily protect themselves, uh, who have in effect evolved uh, as a, we've evolved as a species to protect ourselves uh, from internal problems as well as external ones, how do they fall into these hands? And the Henry the Sixth plays give us sort of sustained exploration to this that actually in a curious way it's our own in our own contemporary world uh we now have long form entertainments i'm thinking of of series like breaking bad or or uh, uh the wire that allow themselves a huge scope in the way that shakespeare ordinarily couldn't have uh to exploring these questions but shakespeare here wrote three plays that allow it, together allow him to watch how it happens, at least as he imagined it. So this is a situation in, uh, in the Henry VI place in which he's interested in how, starting with how a bitterly factionalized political situation arises, where there are two parties that have actually n not all that, as far as we can tell, not all that great differences, uh, and yet reach a point in which they absolutely are incapable of collaborating and cooperating any longer, even when there's danger to the, uh, to the world in which they live, foreign dangers and so forth and so on, they, they refuse any longer to uh, participate. And they factionalize around certain symbols, in this case, a white rose and a red rose. And it obviously, in Shakespeare's view, has to do with a weakened, a well-meaning but weaker central authority than there should be. In the case of these plays, a, a young ruler, Henry VI, who uh, is simply not able to get control of this situation. So we start there. And then... <laughs> Cat, Cat wants to make a cameo appearance. Uh, but then as, as, uh, as Shakespeare develops it, he sees that this situation of a radically uh, factionalized political system can lead to uh, the emergence of what Shakespeare clearly conceives of as fraudulent populism, a populism manipulated by very wealthy, powerful people, actually not interested in the well-being of the, of the underclass, but the underclass can be used. Ambitions, in this case, the uh, power ambitions, dynastic ambitions of enormously powerful people. So that's mm -hmm. where he goes with this. And one of the most brilliant things in these plays is the exploration of this fabulously at once funny and chilling exploration of fraudulent populism. Right. So um, there's a couple possible tyrants who are in these plays. And the one that is maybe most resonant, at least to me today, is um, is Jack Cade. Um, can you talk about this character? Sure. He's actually a cat's paw in the play for uh, an, a far more powerful person, but he serves uh, as uh, the rabble rouser, as the demagogue, who can awaken uh, the uh, and 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 fashion the resentments of the poor. Uh, Shakespeare had throughout his career a rather dim view of the way in which. Uh, but not always, not universally so, but a rather dim view of the way in which the masses uh, can be manipulated. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in this case, by, uh, by this, <laughs> I see that as, I, as we're talking, I don't know if it'll be visible on your podcast, <laughs> I, uh, the very furry tail. Yes, uh, yes, the cat uh, is very insistent on yeah. s sitting on the yeah. desk with me. Uh, any case, uh, Jack Cade uh, arouses uh, very successfully and very much in the manner of a stump politician in our own days uh, of the kind of a, a version of a character in American politics that Mark Twain already gets a very funny account of. I mean, and, uh, of the of the fake uh, stump speaker, my good friends and so forth and so on, who is who is uh, promising uh, to uh, making England, in this case, great again, returning England to uh, its power over its enemies, but also to an enormous imag uh, imagined wealth 
that will uh, be shared by everyone. He'll make, he'll abolish uh, debts. He'll, everyone can drink on his score, as he says. Uh, he will, he will uh, take over basically and offer the poor everything that they might have dreamt of having and arouse their resentments of those who have. This is a moment, this is a famous, any of your listeners will know one moment from Henry VI, part two, as you say, very obscure play, uh, when one of the characters listening to uh, Cade's speeches, a butcher says, uh, first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. Right. That appears on bumper stickers and so forth. <laughs> a contemporary American audience might have heard that line. Um. Yeah, so Cade is, he's from the, the lower classes, and he kind of comes out of nowhere. So he's a real historical figure, I think, who not a ton is known about his his background. Um, and he is kind of like, uh, I, I, he's like a populist. He's like fighting on behalf of the people, but, you know, he's really just stirring up trouble on behalf of one of the, um, you know, noblemen who's, who's vying for the crown. Um and he wants to, you know, he says, like, anyone who can read is should be hanged or whatever, because they obviously are, are wealthy. And so it's it's kind of like an anti-intellectual. Um, he, wants to attack, he specifically wants to attack education. He, he's uh, literacy in general. Uh, anyone's uh, awareness of a difference between most grotesque lies and uh, some... Uh, at least plausible truths. He wants to eradicate. Uh, he wants to kill anyone who, who uh, it's a somewhat Paul Pot vision of killing anyone with an education uh, that goes along with also with wanting to destroy, uh, to burn down the, the courthouses, eliminate the records of obligations that anyone has to anyone else. And so forth. that's the kind of vision uh, that he oper- he offers. Right. And he actually, they, they succeed in breaking through the defenses of London briefly and at least doing some damage, doing some killing uh, and uh, uh, until the, the crowd is moved in a different direction and he loses. But it, it uh, for a while, he actually succeeds in uh, ap- apparently taking some power. Right. And he's, um, I always think about it, he's kind of unique in the, in the Shakespeare canon because he is a... Um, a uh, commoner who is not like a um, a comic figure or clown or you know the humorous rustic who often is like a is introduced for like a scene or two in in Shakespeare plays like he is a uh, commoner who who is you know a a dangerous villain and and that's that that's, that seems to be like a like a unique character. Yes, that's true. Uh, all right. On the other hand, it's significant that he pretends to be a, a Plantagenet himself. I mean, he claims that he has a, a very important uh, uh, family line. I mean, his the people who are actually watching him laugh at this. They know that he uh, he says, "My mother was a Lacy, uh, an important name, aristocratic name." And one of the people who follows him say, "Yeah, she sold laces." Uh, <laughs> and, and, the, the interesting point about that, Arya, I think from my perspective, is that the crowd knows he's lying. The crowd knows all of this is BS. Uh, they, they're not, Shakespeare is not, uh, I'm willing to imagine that there are stupid people out there, there are, but actually there are fewer stupid people in the sense of completely deceived by this than you think. They're not deceived, they know him, they've known him forever. And they know that that most of these claims that he's making are lies, uh, and yet they support him. That's the interesting thing. So one of the, um, I think, most striking elements in Shakespeare is, as they say, this fairly early account uh, of how societies get into trouble is when they, not when they're deceived by uh, uh, by uh, liars. But when they understand that they're being lied to and yet embrace the lies, embrace the liar. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Henry, the, the six plays um, kind of end up with um, Richard III on the, on the, uh, wearing the crown. And he, 
I had forgotten this, but he kind of like has a like quasi democratic like appointment in a way, or like there's some kind of sham election among the no- the like nobles or the parliamentarians to appoint him. They don't. It, the, the Henry the Sixth place don't end with Richard on on the throne, but with Richard's older brother. Okay, right, right. But but uh, what they what does happen there is you can actually it's one of the most interesting moments in these early plays. You can watch Shakespeare's imagination getting fired up uh, in a long, unnecessarily long soliloquy. I mean, unnecessarily long from the purposes of the plot that he gives to this sinister character, Richard Duke of Gloucester. And you can actually feel the excitement in Shakespeare's theatrical imagination as he lets himself go into this character. And so he comes back in what in effect is a fourth play uh, written uh, in the wake of the uh, the play that was Shakespeare's great, in effect, history play breakthrough, mm-hmm. Richard III. It was, it was printed again and again in his lifetime. Uh, it was obviously a lot of people wanted to read it uh, and, and were excited by it in his lifetime. It was clearly success. And that's the play in which he develops this character. And yes, uh, one of the interesting things about that character is that uh, Richard is, uh, again, like Jack Cade, everyone gets that Richard is a very miserable piece of work, dangerous, unreliable, uh, violent, ambitious, ruthless, uh, a, a uh, deceiver, a liar, uh, and so forth. And yet he succeeds in becoming king. And the pivot point in his becoming king, and it's actually rather strange in relation to Shakespeare's own political life, because Shakespeare lived in a, mon- in a monarchical world in which people didn't actually uh, reach the highest uh, position in the land through election. But Shakespeare picks up from his source uh, a, an election scene, source being a work by Thomas More, uh, and he b- builds upon that. He uh, develops it into an astonishing idea, really, uh, of the, at the climactic uh, moment of the rise to power, Richard ascends to power through uh, not not an aristocratic election, actually. They're the citizens of London. They're voters uh-huh. uh, in London who are assembled in a kind of rally, uh, spoken to w- particularly with the warning that there's a kind of there's some kind of threat. That, uh, Richard and his henchmen arrive in armor as if they're and pretend to be out of breath as if they've been fighting a battle, and then they organize the uh, the citizens to vote for him. Uh, in effect, as king. Long live Richard, uh, England's uh, royal king. And the, now the interesting thing there is that Shakespeare wrote effectively two different versions of the scene. In one of which, uh, the when Richard's shills start chanting, the equivalent of lock her up or whatever, I mean, <laughs> start chanting to the crowd, um, Shakespeare writes that uh, the mayor says, uh, long live Richard, and the mayor says, amen. So it's just the mayor who's already in Richard's pocket who says, amen. And then in a different version of the of the same scene, it says, all, everyone shouts, amen. So it's as if Shakespeare himself or his company, trying to think about how to stage the play, had two different ways of imagining what happened, and one of which it's the people who are actually in the cons- in on the conspiracy who produce a fake election. And in the other, it actually is a kind of popular uh, ascent to his rise. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in any case, I've thought a lot about why Shakespeare, as I say, it's anomalous because this isn't how kings became kings in Shakespeare's world. Uh, why he, his mind came back to this scene uh, and was so interested in this moment. I don't have a very clear answer. I mean, we could say that, of course, he was prophetic and understood that in a different system, people would be elected. Uh, when he asked himself, how would a tyrant come to power? He thought, well, election. But I think it had to do with uh, with what Shakespeare's vocation was, which was the manipulation of crowds. 
uh, Shakespeare was unbelievably brilliant, uh, had the gifts of a brilliant demagogue himself. <laughs> he understood very, very deeply what it meant to m m maneuver people into assenting to things or resisting things. And I think he understood himself in a, uh, was interested in his own power, uh, including a kind of ethical judgment about that power, some uneasiness, some queasiness about that power. You can see it in, in Antony's famous speech in Julius Caesar as well, lots of other moments in which Shakespeare is interested in how crowds are manipulated, how mobs are used. Yeah, uh, let's, so let's skip ahead maybe just a little bit to stay on that particular theme of, of like Shakespeare's view of the people, democracy, the mob, like there wasn't really, you know, there wasn't the kind of democracy we know back then, obviously. Uh, but he seemed, you know, if you looking at uh, Julius Caesar, looking at Richard III, looking at Coriolanus, he seemed to have a deep distrust of like the empowered citizenry and their ability to be turned into a, a mob and be misled. I think he did have, uh, just, first of all, Shakespeare has no experience of, of uh, liberal democracies. I mean, he lives uh, in an entirely different system. He's not a uh, he's not a citizen of England. He's a subject of the Queen of England. I mean, and uh, then of the King of England. I mean, that so he he this is not his world, and he lives in a world also without anything like democratic public space, any uh, freedom of speech, uh, any uh, podcasts, uh, <laughs> any any way of sharing. Uh, opinions in in a space in which you're allowed to say what you want. That's not his world. At the same time, and Shakespeare is very wary of how mobs are used in such a world, uh, manipulated, uh, not uh, get, not given access to any actual truths about their the situation that they're in. The interesting thing to me about this is that it's not only skepticism that one sees in Shakespeare. It's also, and this is also part of his profession, his vocation. He, if he's skeptical, if he's wary, if he is uh, sometimes cynical about the mob, he's also a profound believer in, uh, in effect, what it means to be, to make a judgment with a large number of people uh, that say that's what the theater is about, uh, giving your assent in the form of paying your pennies uh, to watch a play uh, and to judge it. So I find uh, Shakespeare oddly divided about this. It's not, as it, it's not only that he's, he, he had a choice, Shakespeare, even in his own career. He could have become, as he, as we can glimpse in those long erotic poems that he wrote and dedicated to the Earl of Southampton, Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucrece, he could have become, in effect, the favorite writer of some enormously wealthy aristocrat. But instead, he chose to be in one of the only situations in his world in which actually the, the crowd decided what it liked and didn't like, whether it would support this or not support this form. And that's, I think, a very important indication about Shakespeare politically as well as, as aesthetically. And the sign of it really is at the end of his career in that remarkable and, again, little-known play, Coriolanus, uh, that last tragedy that he ever wrote, in which, once again, one gets a hungry and anxious and uh, a potentially violent crowd, a mob, and they actually, in, in Shakespeare's account, have a thoughtful political life. They can be manipulated, yes. Uh, they can be uh, tricked, yes but they actually can be awakened in Shakespeare's account into understanding what their interests really are. Yeah, that, that's interesting. And, um, you know, uh, Coriolanus is another play that's not, I think there was a movie of it in the past couple of years, but it's not that's really recently, in the culture. Vanessa Fine. It's quite good. Yeah, it, it was like, I never even heard of it before I went to college and ended up reading it. Um, and it's a strange, it's a strange play uh, that maybe we could talk about a little bit more. So let's go back to uh, Richard the Third and uh, ending a tyranny and how how that how tyranny is resisted in in that play and overcome eventually. 
I mean, tyranny is, once a tyrant is established, a true tyrant is established in Shakespeare's view, the, there is no easy way out. Uh, it's uh, in the case of Richard III, as in the case of Macbeth, it takes, in effect, a civil war. Uh, this is not a happy solution to the end. Uh, what in Shakespeare's view tends to happen is that, uh, certainly in Richard III, is that the people who enabled the tyrant to come to power are often the first to go. There's a kind of, uh, uh, there's a kind of, um, political paranoia uh, built into uh, the rise of the tyrant. That means that his principal allies are, are usually rolled over fairly quickly. Uh, and what happens, at least in Shakespeare's view, was increasingly the tyrant rules uh, not with wise advisors, or even particularly cunning advisors, but with people who uh, do little more than uh, ratify his own uh, most uh, extreme of violent impulses. Mm -hmm. uh, so you get Richard uh, doing when, when in effect, uh, his principal ally Buckingham expresses some reservations about killing the little children that he wants to get rid of. You have Richard getting rid of Buckingham and going forward, finding a uh, uh, someone who will just do the dirty work. And likewise, <clears throat> Macbeth says to Lady Macbeth, M Macbeth who has relied uh, actually to his deep harm on his conversations with his wife, at a certain point says, I'm just going to do the first, what he calls the firstlings of my heart. My, I'm going to rule by impulse, in effect. Mm -hmm. I'll trust my own impulses. And Shakespeare thinks that this is one of the things that accelerates the possibility of uh, disaster of the civil war that ends the, the tyranny in the case of both Richard III and Macbeth. Better not to go, go there in, a, in Shakespeare's account. It's better not to actually get that deeply into uh, the trouble, to try to figure out a way of stopping it before it happens. Mm -hmm. um, so there's uh, two plays that you write about that involve um, Mad Kings, uh, Lear, and uh, The Winter's Tale with uh, Leontes. Um, and you write in particular about how the the leader is clearly losing his mental stability, but his courtiers and the people around him um, continue to flatter him. And there's there are a couple of rare examples, uh, Kent and... Uh, Paul, no, I can't, remember the, I can't remember the name of the character in Winter's Tale. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, Polina, um, who are willing to challenge, but in both those cases, those characters get exiled. Um, there's some question right now about whether our president is entirely with his mental faculties or not. You know, he famously took a test in which he scored very well, and he was very proud of that, uh, but that didn't entirely answer the question. Uh, what, do you, what do you see of the resonances of, of the, that aspect of these two plays? I mean, I think what happens is that the... Uh, the ruler, by virtue of being a ruler in, in, a, in such a system in which there are no significant checks and balances, no significant restraints, as in, uh, as in the world that's depicted in King Lear or the world that's depicted in The Winter's Tale, the ruler can persuade himself that he is, uh, I don't think that Leontes uses the term for himself that he's a stable genius, uh, but but in effect, that is when he when when his principal advisor, someone named Camilo, uh, tries to tell him that actually his fears and his thought, his anxieties, and rages are completely mad. Uh, he doesn't quite say that, but he says he warns him against them. He he simply gets rid of uh, this sane advisor Camilo, who's, who in fact has to flee. Same with Kent, because the system doesn't al allow, has very little uh, way of, of uh, 
responding to someone who was in that level, who's in that position of power, once that person begins to behave irrationally. That's you have some people who are loyal servants, civil servants, as we would say, uh, Kent, uh, most impressively in uh, King Lear. But the system uh, gives so much power to the person in charge, the king in this, and the, the king in these cases, that uh, even the sane and loving objections of were inter interested in the case of Kent or in the case of, of uh, Camilo, who've served this ruler all their lives, they, uh, they are simply swept away. Uh, and in the case of King Lear, the most remarkable moment, the most moving and strange moment is not actually a, a servant responding exactly to madness, but to some act that is so morally loathsome that the servant uh, responds, can't allow it to go on. And that's a nameless character, one of the, I think, the most remarkable characters in Shakespeare, uh, who's not responding to Lear in this case, who's already at that point fallen from uh, position because of his own stupidity, foolish act, narcissism, greed uh, uh, for, for flattery. But rather, the country is being ruled by the uh, Earl of Cornwall, who is torturing a prisoner. Uh, who was accused of a, a treason. And in the midst of the torture, uh, which is being conducted by the highest power in the land, a nameless servant comes forward and says, hold your hand, stop, my lord. Uh, I've served you all my life, but better service have I never done you than now to tell you to hold. And that is to say, they're shocked. I mean, this is a nobody. Uh, but a person who's standing there and who won't allow something that he regards as uh, morally unacceptable uh, torture uh, to go on. And he's actually, in the end, killed for his intervention and thrown on the dunghill, but not before he actually gives a fatal blow against uh, the uh, torturer. I find that the most astonishing single political moment in maybe in all of Shakespeare. Hmm. Yeah, I, I appreciate you okay. drawing that out in your uh, chapter on Lear because I have read the play a couple times. <laughs> I completely forgot about that that instance, which is like minor, and it, it's I guess it's, it's a plot, you know, a plot mechanical item in some way because they need to get a Cornwall kind of get him off the scene. Um, yeah. But the you know it didn't need to be done in, in exactly that way, and it didn't need to be like a. Uh, commoner character. Who I, think is, would, I think it would have shocked Shakespeare's audience uh, that, that to have a, a servant kill his master, but to, to be asked to identify morally and politically with the servant and not with the master, mm -hmm. uh, with, the, with the villain uh, in the technical sense of a, of a mere nobody servant and not with the, with the earl, the ruler, that's astonishing. Mm -hmm. um, so... <laughs> Trump is in some ways similar to some of these tyrannical figures from Shakespeare, but in other ways he is kind of a comic character and a buffoonish character and someone who is, it's absurd that he is our president. Um, I don't know if there's an absurd king in, I mean, there's kings like, like Leontes we were just discussing who are doing, who do things that are completely absurd, but there's some something in Trump that's the combination of threatening and farcical. And I don't know if there's a character like that in Shakespeare. Uh, the one that came to mind was Dogberry, but he doesn't really have that much power. Um, do you, do you see this in reflected in anywhere in the Shakespeare's place? I think in some ways, the most interesting version of that in Shakespeare <coughs> is actually with Richard III, and with the way in which the, Shakespeare has the mood shift when Richard III actually finally gets into power. That is to say, I think Shakespeare invites you to uh, laugh, not only laugh at, but laugh with uh, Richard when he's rising to power, because he's, it's so absurd. He looks weird, he is weird, uh, he's very, uh, everyone 
uh, finds him at once grotesque and and uh, negligible, uh, and then he's in power, and then the mood, the laughter curdles. Mm. Uh, the what what had looked, uh, yes, a little bit sinister, but also very funny. Uh, and in which we secretly actually enjoy the transgression. We enjoy the release of the crazy things he says, the incredible aggression that that uh, he manifests, the violation of the norms of behavior. We actually, I think, are uh, allowed to enjoy those things in that play. And then they they suddenly turn very, very ugly mm-hmm. when he gets in power. Okay, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah he is... Richard is a comic character in some ways, and he kind of pulls jokes and stuff and kind of makes jokes to the audience as, as asides. And um, yeah, so he's not just this pure, <laughs> this pure figure of evil. He's also like a, a figure of fun at some points. Now, yeah, there's a moment in which, in which he is actually, I mean, it's ghastly. Of course, he is a figure of evil. I mean, he's hiring murder, two, two thugs to murder his brother. Uh, and... He says to them, like the equivalent of, of complimenting uh, uh, neo-Nazis, he says to them, uh, your eyes drop millstones where others drop tears. I like you, lads, he says. Now, I think we're actually invited to enjoy that moment, not to be horrified in the moral sense. Of course, it is horrifying, but it's also amusing. Mm-hmm. And we're invited to, to share the amusement. But it, the, the amusement dries up in the, in the play. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, I think those are all the questions I have. We're about out of time. Uh, is there anything else you want to say before we uh, close out? Yes, I want to say one other thing, Arie, which is that to, to return for a moment to uh, Coriolanus, uh, what it is most interesting to me about Coriolanus is not or not only the weird depiction of the abnormal psychology of the potential tyrant, Coriolanus, that say Shakespeare sees in Coriolanus as he sees in Richard III and elsewhere that there's something psychologically twisted and perverse about these pe- this kind of person. And he develops this actually in an extraordinary way in Coriolanus. But what strikes me uh, most powerfully is that the crucial political resistance to the rise of the tyrant in Coriolanus comes from very ordinary and not particularly admirable uh, politicians. They're, call, they're the tribunes, Sicinius and Brutus, they're called, of the people. They're not great idealists. They're not noble intellectuals. They're not, uh, they're just ordinary uh, retail politicians. Uh, and they succeed. By, and how do they succeed? They succeed by insisting on the ordinary norms of political life in Rome, in this case, that is to say, insisting on the letter of the law, insisting on procedure. Coriolanus, they say, has to do certain things before he becomes a uh, consul. And by insisting on this, they finally make him blow up uh, and they defeat him. So Shakespeare has, again, it's a very odd thing to do if you're a dramatist because it's not usually the stuff of great drama, but the insistence on the law. Uh, and that's in, curiously where Shakespeare seems to have ended up uh, in his political vision. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stephen Greenblatt, uh, the book is Tyrant, Shakespeare on Politics. Um, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to come on today. Thank you, Ari. Nice to talk to you. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.